I'm Mark Sundberg, and I'm a behavior analyst, uh, especially interested in language and Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior. A thorough behavior analysis of what constitutes language. You can learn a bag of tricks without the analysis, and uh, you may find yourself that ABA doesn't work if you don't understand the functional analysis of behavior. If you're doing ABA without verbal behavior, you're missing the, the most important component of developing the language repertoire of a child with autism. You gotta have a good response form, and you need to have that form occur under a variety of functions. You need to develop both repertoires. Uh, both are equally important. On their own, there's not much you can do. Perhaps the most powerful verbal opera. If you look at uh, the power of the echoic repertoire, it's responsible for bidirectional naming. Uh, it, without that, the self echoic is e extremely important. Uh, aspects of thinking and perception and so on. That is, the echoic isn't just repeating sounds, it's a very functional tool in language acquisition and, and plays a major role. Perhaps the most important verbal operant for the child with autism, the nonverbal child with autism. It's our closest connection to traditional uh, speech therapy and speech and language training is developing expressive language, teaching the tact. You can't do without interverbal behavior uh, for academic, social uh, uh, repertoires. It's all a huge part of all of our verbal interactions with each other, conversations, just interverbal relations. Uh, probably the least understood of the aspects of Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior, but potentially one of the most powerful concepts Skinner came up with. Learning to learn. Acquiring a repertoire that will provide you with more repertoires. Future learning that bring you in contact with new stimuli, new motivators, new, new reinforcers that can have far-reaching effects now in establishing skills. Uh, Jack's class helped a lot in terms of teaching me behavior analysis. Jack taught, taught me to be a behavior analyst. B.F. Skinner and Jack Michael walk in the back. You know, we're all kind of sitting up there going, oh my God, <laughs> you know. We were on to something. We were doing something that was important enough that Skinner would attend. When we did this stuff in the 70s, we were all super excited about it. I mean, it was like we, we knew we had something and Nobody knew anything about it for the most part, but we saw it work every day. And we had Jack who was telling us, you know, what to do next. RFT doesn't have a solid foundation in early intervention for kids with autism. An analysis of language should cover all of it. I mean, you should, you only need one analysis from babbling to dementia, you know. <laughs> It's time we start collaborating. Trying to bring all the camps together is, is a little gradual. Um, you get, I think, you get stuck in your own methodology and, and you know, we're, we're very much stuck in the verbal behavior camp. We're, we're starting now uh, to create uh, a generative learning assessment tool. So we've got the, the VBMAP generative learning assessment. Uh, to publish a, a, a higher level VB map for uh, kids that you know, had kind of maxed out on the VB map or that were getting to the top of it. So, um, I believe your advisor was Jack Michael. That's correct. So, uh, you can tell us a little bit about. How did you get 
into the field and maybe a little bit about his influence on your work? Certainly. Well, I, I was fortunate to uh, uh, be able to go to Western Michigan University, which happened to only be about 15 miles from my hometown. And uh, I had initially kind of learned traditional psychology and traditional approaches. And the early, actually 1971, 72, I studied traditional psychology and then transferred to Western Michigan when I saw that they had a behavior analysis program. And I had become very interested in that. And uh, when I went to Western, uh, I started working for Dick Mallott in his rat lab, and I was ultimately the official rat man, where I was in charge of 600 rats for Mallott's 1,000 students a semester rat training course. It was an amazing system, and that was my first real entrance into behavior analysis, uh, Mallott's formal uh, classes and such. Uh, my second semester at Western, I took Jack Michael's verbal behavior class. So I was just really learning behavior analysis coming from a kind of Freudian sort of tradition. And it, it took me a while to learn how to talk like a behavior analyst. My first semester, I got corrected quite a bit. Uh, Jack's class helped a lot in terms of teaching me behavior analysis. Jack taught, taught me to be a behavior analyst in, the, in that course. And at the same time, that same semester, I went to work at the Kalamazoo Valley Multi Handicap Center. Uh, and that was uh, a requirement. We had to get a 10 hour uh, internship for our bachelor's degree at, at Western. And so I worked two hours a day, five days a week, and uh, with four different kids, a half hour for each child. And uh, I, I had immersed myself in a, in a community that was extremely behavioral. This whole center, we had about 60 or 70 kids between 0 and 25, all with severe problems. This was a specialty program, uh, and it was directed by a guy named Jerry Shook, who's the guy that started the certification board. Jerry was my boss for six years. Uh, so I, I ended up staying at that center after I did my internship, and uh, ultimately got a full-time job there and over the years ended up being Jerry's assistant by the time I, I left. In this community, in this uh, center, there were uh, several other of Jack Michael's students and, and other students. Brian Iwata uh, had uh, a lot of his students working there and pretty much everybody that went through Western Michigan University in those, in those days uh, did their internship uh, out there. And uh, we began doing a series of research and then uh, uh, both Jack and Brian started coming out for our weekly research meetings, and uh, um, that was that was really fun because it was it was kind of exciting. You know, Brian was maybe 27 years old, just getting started, his first year out of Florida State, and so he was getting started. Uh, and and uh, uh, of course, Jack had become very interested in seeing verbal behavior applied. Uh, one of the, the the children I had was a, a deaf girl, about 13 or 14, that had severe behavior problems, and uh, yet she could sign, and, and uh, um, I, I found the things that I was learning in Jack Michael's course, I was able to immediately apply in the classroom. You know, I was 20, 21 years, I think I was 20 years old uh, doing that, and, and uh, uh, it was fascinating. For example, man training, uh, in looking at this particular girl, her man repertoire was basically non-existent, although she could tact hundreds of pictures, but yet her way of manding was behavior problems, tantrums, aggression, and so on. And uh, so I set up a little man program, just kind of using what I had learned uh, from verbal behavior about the man and, and such, and uh, it, it very quickly reduced her negative behaviors. And uh, so I found that pretty fascinating. And you're a pioneer that little man training program with this girl. You have attended a behavioral behavior course, but it was not an application. No, no. Jack talked about things like that, like he talked about teaching manding to, to individuals and that you, you need to be able to man. But as far as the procedures and any, any of that, uh, I, I, I do recall a situation where I was sitting down working with uh, uh, the girl and, and uh, uh, Jack had, had said, why don't you teach her, teach her to man? You know, see if you can teach her to man. I said, well, how, how, how do we do that, Jack? And he says, well, I don't know. 
let's figure it out. <laughs> you know, what's she want? <laughs> and so it was kind of like, you know, he, he was involved in, at that stage. And uh, probably what I consider to be the most fortunate event in my whole career that basically set my career going is I became very interested in sign language because of, of this girl. And I, I, she taught me sign. I mean, she'd, I'd hold up a card and she'd say shoe and I'd learn shoe and book and hat and car and tree very rapidly. And um, uh, the center offered a sign language class. Some of the other staff taught sign language class, sign language. And we had a, a deaf woman that was on our staff named Alberta Westman. And Alberta and I worked in the same classroom together. And, and she taught me signs as well. And, and uh, she taught one of the advanced sign language classes. And I became very interested. And, and ultimately, uh, I became an interpreter for the deaf and uh, began teaching uh, sign language. When the person that was teaching it graduated and left, I took over his position and began teaching uh, sign language. And then I uh, started offering a course at the community college. So I had an introduction to sign language course at the community college. And I get my course roster, and on my roster is Jack Michael. He had signed up for my sign language class. During, it was on sabbatical and <laughs> decided he, he wanted to learn sign language. So. Uh, I had Jack Michael as a student for two semesters. He took level one and level two of my sign course. Uh, at that point, you were not a PhD student. Well, I was an undergrad. I was I was a brand new graduate student. Uh, I at that point I was I was 21 or 22. It was a course that a lot of the people from the center took, and that's so there was a lot of a lot of the community there that was very interested. Well, uh, Jack being Jack. Uh, basically hijacked my course <laughs> and, and uh, taught me how to teach verbal behavior. We started adding all kinds of elements to it, like what about you know, stimulus selection-based uh, communication systems. And it, it, it gradually uh, merged into a, um, applications of verbal behavior, uh, where in the course we began to talk about a number of those things. And, uh, while Jack was on sabbatical and all the students were from the, the handicap center, Jack wanted to take uh, the second course, and he had said, "Well, why don't why don't you teach it at my house?" And he said, I, "I don't like going down to campus. I'm on sabbatical, and I, I, I you know if I don't have to go into Wood Hall was where the psych department. I'd rather not." And uh, uh, so we did. I taught a course, full semester course at, at Jack's house, uh, with about a dozen other graduate students for the most part. And, and again, that course kind of evolved into a verbal behavior applications course, which Jack's return back to teaching, which was uh, the fall of, of uh, 1976. Uh, his sabbatical was 75, 76. So in the fall, he offered a course called verbal behavior applications. Uh, and I was his teaching assistant along with uh, a guy named Norm Peterson. So Norm and I were both uh, involved in that class. And basically what Jack did was each week we took a different element of applications, like we looked at brain injury, we looked at, at developmental disabilities, the ape language research uh, uh, and such, and, and uh, uh, basically went to all the various areas that verbal behavior could be applied. And it was all pretty much discovery because people weren't doing much of that, yet um, uh, Jack kind of encouraged you know, us all to, to develop various aspects. There was one guy in the class, his name was uh, Forrest Brock, and Forrest worked in a geriatric center. And so Forrest began to collect data with the, the elderly and, and, and that, and, and uh, uh, it, it was kind of fun. So we'd get into class and people would share what, what kind of applications they had done. We weren't necessarily doing any formal research, it was, it was just exploration. Can, can you look at a person that's lost their verbal repertoire and can, can verbal behavior help in, in ways? And in fact, I went to a presentation this morning where there's now a whole assessment, on a verbal behavior assessment for uh, stroke victims and to be able to identify what part of their verbal repertoire was uh, impaired. And, and actually that was done by another one of Jack Michael's students, uh, a woman named Barb Esch, who is also a speech pathologist. And, and, uh, Barb's been involved in our projects. You know, you've translated some of her work in the in the VV map. Uh, so uh, out of that time period, we really kind of begin to lay out 
uh, a lot of the potential of, of verbal behavior. And at the same time, at the, at the Handicap Center, uh, uh, we're working with that specific population, but there was a, a pretty strong need for dissertation and thesis topics, obviously, for all the students. And uh, many of Jack's students were interested in doing empirical research in verbal behavior. So uh, we basically set up what, what I, I, I'm pretty sure was Jack Michael's first verbal behavior research lab, where Jack, as I said, would come out each week and he'd watch us work with the kids in the sessions and we would uh, meet in a formal meeting and people would present what their proposals and what kind of things they were doing and Jack would kind of guide everybody into, into doing that. Uh, uh, one of the topics I early took on early was man training and trying to quantify that. And we went through the phase of, of uh, establishing stimuli was what Jack first called the learned establishing operation and separating that from unlearned uh, establishing operations, and which was probably one of his major contributions to the concept of motivation was adding learned motivation and the, the condition motivating operation, the reflexive, the transitive condition motivating operations. So we begin to do research on those concepts uh, uh, and uh, many of Jack's students then got their, their, their master's, uh, master's degree. At that time it was mostly master's students because Western's PhD program didn't start till 1974. So it was just, they were just kind of going and, and there weren't many of the PhD students at that time that were specifically interested in verbal behavior. Um, so we had this mass collection of master's students and we did manned research, tact, interverbal, all the verbal operants. We, we uh, ran in probably a four or five year period, we ran about 50 research studies, empirical studies that um, we presented at MABA, which was the Midwestern Association for Behavior Analysis was the conference at that point in time and uh, we do symposia and, and such. And I uh, recall one of the symposia that our crew did, so we've got uh, four, uh, four presenters, all from the center, all doing, you know, one on the man, one on the tact, one on the interverbal, and at full house, and you know, again, we're all young. You know, we, we basically are, are just kind of figuring things out as we go along, and, and uh, uh, shortly after the presentation started, uh, B.F. Skinner and Jack Michael walk in the back. You know, we're all kind of sitting up there going, oh my God, <laughs> you know, how do we handle this? And, and it was just, it was thrilling but nerve wracking, uh, but uh, it was, it was kind of like, it let us know that we were on to something. We were doing something that was important enough that Skinner would attend and wanted to see his book being applied. And of course, Jack had you know, talked to him. Jack and Skinner interacted a lot, which was very helpful. Uh, in fact, when we, in Jack's classes, he'd say, well, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll ask Skinner, you know, and then he'd come back in on Monday and say, well, I talked to Skinner last night, and Skinner said da 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 and it was, it was kind of nice, because we felt we had an in uh, at, at that time, and again, you know, this is almost 50 years ago uh, that, that these things were going on, so a lot, there was a lot of uh, unknown things, but when we began to go out and present, uh, we'd meet a lot of people that, other, other behavior analysts that were doing similar things, like uh, Joe Pear's students up at Manitoba. Uh, Joe had a verbal behavior research lab that he was very interested in. Joe Spradlin, uh, University of Kansas in Parsons, had, had already done a lot of groundbreaking research in verbal behavior, and, and one of them was uh, Joe developed an assessment tool called the Parsons Language Sample, and he published it in 1963. And uh, it basically was the very first assessment that assessed language through the verbal operants, man, tact, interverbal, and, and so on. And uh, I, I ultimately, I used that uh, for my doctoral dissertation. That's what I used to measure uh, uh, my, my participants in, in the study. And, and <clears throat> Joe and I began to interact a lot during the 70s. And uh, uh, I, had, I had asked Joe that, um, can I modify your assessment? Because the assessment was designed for patients at the Parsons State Hospital. So they were adult patients. And, and so uh, Joe's, uh, uh, for example, his man trial was you give the patient a cigarette and see if they ask for a lighter. 
you know, it's like, and I'd say, Joe, you know, can we change your examples? And, you know, because those aren't appropriate necessarily. And, and Joe had, had said, uh, you can do whatever you want uh, with that assessment. It, it never worked. It never went anywhere. I published it about 12 years ago. It's never been cited. Uh, you know, uh, go ahead, make any changes you want. And, and so uh, I began to mess with it and make various changes. I sent him to Joe. I said, it looks good. And, you know, uh, uh, basically tailoring it toward the nonverbal uh, population, not, not necessarily the, the adult population or, or the psychotic or, or uh, that, but more geared toward uh, children with, with various kinds of, of intellectual disabilities, kids with autism, blind deaf kids, cerebral palsy kids, I and mean, we had virtually every kind of combination. Again, it was called the multi-handicap center. So all the kids that were there were blind and deaf or that were emotionally impaired and mentally retarded was the term at the time. So uh, that, that was the, the, the beginnings of the BE map report. Absolutely. Later. You bet. That was the beginning. Uh, and uh, what year are we talking about? Uh, this was uh, about 1977, 1978, during, during that time period. At that time you were already a PhD student I, Michael. Yeah, I, he was my master's advisor. Uh, so when I uh, finished my bachelor's degree in 75, I started the master's program. And uh, uh, my advisor was uh, actually is another weird situation there. I was accepted by Dan Hirsch. Uh, as my advisor in the master's program, and then Jack Michael and Brian Iwata were my committee members. And uh, then in the first year, Dan Hirsch left Western Michigan University, and uh, so Jack Michael became my, the chair of my committee, along with uh, Brian, and then Paul Mountjoy was on, on the committee. Uh, then in 1977, I, I got into the PhD program. And uh, at that point, things really begin to take off. Jerry Shook gave me 20 hours a week as research director at the Handicap Center. So he was supportive of having students come in, run their thesis. I mean, he's basically funding them, paying them to run their master's thesis. And, uh, and that's where, again, we ended up with 50 or so studies was because uh, people could come out there and, the, you know, the word got out. If you're interested in verbal behavior, go to the Handicap Center and you can plug yourself into their system and, and uh, you know, so we had uh, many of the faculty members, students uh, came. Uh, so we, uh, again, begin to up the, the game in terms of presentations. And, you know, I, I look back and, and that time period, I graduated in 1980, but that time period from 75 to 80, I've made a career out of. I mean, I've, I've basically been doing the same thing since then, just you know, gradually refining it year after year after year, but the core concepts and what I, I learned haven't changed a, a, a bit for the most part. It, it was all you know, uh, trying to make some kind of use of verbal behavior other than just kind of a theoretical concept for discussion, and, and which it had been, as you I'm sure know, the first 20 years after Skinner published the book, uh, it had hardly been used at all. Nope, nope. The, there were only 3,000 copies uh, printed of the 1957 book when it first came out. And by in the 1970s, you could still buy one of those 3,000s. Uh, when Jack was teaching verbal behavior, I'd go into the bookstore and get a brand new copy of that book. Well, when the book sold out of 3,000 copies, um, uh, it went out of print. So verbal behavior went, went out of print from... Uh, uh, Appleton Century Cross and, and uh, was unavailable and then Prentice Hall picked up the book and that's the white version. So the brown version of verbal behavior is Appleton Century Cross, only 3,000 of those in the world. And you got one of them, hang on to it. Uh, is it signed by Skinner? <laughs> well, you, you got the book anyway, but then Prentice Hall's book went out of print also. And that's where uh, Julie Vargas and the B.F. Skinner Foundation then uh, have published it since 1991. At that time, uh, how do you recall was Jack Michael's supervision or advising style? I mean, how would you describe it? Uh, well, you, you could say it was loose but intense, but uh, uh, very, uh, very sincere. Jack was really interested in, in these and uh, concepts and stuff, and Jack was always on. I mean, you were. Uh, 
you were always a student. <laughs> he was always teaching you something. It was always, uh, every opportunity was a teaching opportunity. And, and so uh, I, I was his teaching assistant as well. And I, I assisted him, I, I believe, in, in f over my, as a PhD student uh, and master's student, um, 14 graduate courses and undergraduate courses. I was his teaching assistant. So we had a lot of contact, and uh, you know, I'd say we, we, we became friends as well. I mean, we used to go hang out socially. Jack loved to dance, and on Thursday nights, we used to have the experimental student colloquium. So uh, we'd, we'd have an event Thursday, and then every Thursday night, the whole gang would go out dancing, and Jack just loved to do that. And he'd often you know, like encourage everybody, he goes, come on, come, come to the work session, and then we're gonna go play. Uh, so he, he was definitely uh, uh, both an enjoyable person, but he, he scared the crap out of a lot of people because he didn't hold anything back. He told it like it was, and if you were screwing up, he told you you were screwing up. And if you were doing bad, I mean, just, you know, he, he was liberal with punishment. <laughs> uh, he said, he, 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 you got to be strict on students, and he was. His, his courses, he'd start out his course and say, if I catch you cheating, I'm reporting you to the dean, and you're going to get kicked out of the college. That's it. That's what's going to happen. Don't cheat in my classes. <laughs> you know, and he was like, uh, uh, so there was a degree of stimulus control that he had established o over the students, and, and, and what was kind of became clear over the years as I graduated and, and sort of moved on. Uh, Jack was the, the behavior analyst for the behavior analyst. He was the teacher of the teachers. He was the go-to person. If there was any, any issue in the field that was going on, go ask Jack is what you know, people would end up saying. Jack would have a clear explanation of, of things and, and uh, uh, often generating controversy like watching him and Murray Sidman argue about stimulus equivalence. You know, Murray never liked the establishing operation concept and, uh, 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 you know, so Sidman avoidance uh, from Jack's point of view didn't exist. It was a reflexive establishing operation. It was a motivating variable, not a stimulus variable. Well, that, that, those kind of arguments of what's the source of control? Is it a discriminative stimulus? What, is it aversive stimulus, or is it a motivating operation? And, and uh, uh, those arguments were often pretty colorful in, in watching those occur at, at ABBA conferences. What were the, the, the main challenges that came to fore at the time? Because I, I would assume that it's hard to, I mean, if you don't have any reference from previous studies, yeah. how would you know that you were going to a particular opera and you were not mixing things? Yes, the, 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 probably one of the biggest challenges was there was really no research methodology for studying language as behavior. So if we look in linguistics, language is never really considered solely behavior. It's all a cognitive function and processing and all. So looking at trying to come up with um, a methodology for, for studying language was, was tricky, and that's where Brian and I, Iwata and I often had a lot of conflicts. They used a methodology um, uh, that Willard Day had developed a, a methodology that he called radical methodology where the experimenter's behavior is the dependent variable and the subject's behavior is the independent variable. That is, the subjects are changing the, the researcher. And so what my dissertation was about was the application of Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior to language assessment. So I had empirical data with six nonverbal kids. I taught all those kids sign language. They all learned man, tact, interverbal uh, over you know, a, a one or two year period. Uh, yet it, it, could, it didn't fit into a multiple baseline. You couldn't do a reversal. You, you, know, you could do a multiple probe design. I mean, there were, the, the standard job of designs didn't quite fit. It was, so it was a, it was a little different. It, it was a little odd, but what had, uh, change was my own verbal behavior about how to teach verbal behavior, how to talk about it, what its components were. Ultimately, Jack and I decided that let's let's go for a journal. And so, with Jack's direction, then I started the analysis of verbal behavior. Uh, and Jack was the, published the first paper in there. Um, and and. Uh, we begin to recruit other other people and uh, uh, begin to get more and more submissions. So the analysis of verbal behavior officially started in in 1985, 
and that, of course, is, is still running today. I ran it out of my house for the first 14 volumes. I was the editor and, and typesetter practically and did, did all of the, the nuts and bolts of that. But again, that was, I always had, you know, it, well after I graduated, all the way through until he died, Jack was always there. I mean, he and I had a good relationship and, you know, would see each other several times a year at conferences and wrote things together and did various projects over the, over the years. But the Verbal Behavior Journal was something that he was really supportive of, encouraged me to you know, continue at it and, and promoted it and did all kinds of things. And, and one of the reasons we started that was at the time, uh, Jabba and Jayab really wanted nothing to do with verbal behavior. We couldn't get our stuff published. Jabba didn't like it because they didn't like our designs. We didn't, they didn't like the way that we were doing things and, and uh, it just didn't fit. Jayab thought our stuff was too applied uh, and, and so we ultimately said we need our own journal. And, and uh, again, that's, that's what we did and it's, it's you know, still there today. Uh, so where I was was back at STARS. We had been publishing a lot of the things that we were doing in the Verbal Behavior Journal in the, in the early years, the man training programs, the interverbal work, all of that that was in there. But we didn't have it in a package that behavior analysts could look at it and say, how do I do a verbal behavior program? I mean, our whole school was set up on the verbal, we had developed the verbal behavior model, it had set up. Every session was a language training session, and whether it was a man session, tact, interverbal, or matching the sample, or mixed VB, we had sessions, we did all kinds of aspects of verbal behavior depending on, on the child, but the whole school was focused on verbal behavior. Every one of our staff mastered verbal behavior. That was a requirement. I did staff training. I did hands-on supervision and monitoring with, with everybody. And um, we'd, we'd, we'd uh, uh, have them read verbal behavior and in, in segments and, and such. So we had, we had developed that community, had the verbal behavior journal kind of going. So. Uh, that was a very rich period. A, a lot of the, um, uh, some of the studies we did on manding for information, for example, we ran at, at that uh, center, uh, part of the automatic reinforcement study that I had done with Jack. We, we ran a couple subjects uh, at, the, at, at uh, that center as well. Uh, but by then I thought things were kind of coming together pretty well, and again, the. The, the teaching language book and the ABLES were, were pretty well received and surprisingly we were selling a lot of ABLES to public schools that school systems were starting to buy in and, and uh, so I mean it was a surprising success in, in the sense that that content uh, got out there. I, I, had, I had some trouble with the ABLES, you know, it's like I'm going now, you know, what we did with the ABLES was we did a task analysis of each of the verbal operants and so there were 475 different items. So if you say, hey, do this assessment on the kid, there's only 470 things you need to test. And I wanted to scrap the whole system and start over. What I wanted was language needs to be, it should be a probe. An assessment can only probe a repertoire. Let's sample a man, you know, and it's got to be quick and efficient and, and you just want to, uh, look at the verbal operants and you want to put it in a developmental model. We didn't put the ABLES in a developmental model. We, it wasn't a sample. I mean, it was just, I had a, a, a litany of problems that, that uh, to me were unsolvable with the existing thing. And, and uh, so Jim revised the ABLES uh, on his own and, and then I did the VB map, uh, the kind of way that I thought it might be easier uh, to do. And I, and, and, uh, I started that in about 2005, 2006, ultimately published that in 2008. Uh, and um, I, I've been very pleased with the way that, you know, it's been received and, and translated into, into different languages. I think I've got about 15 or 16 different languages right now with another over 20 uh, uh, other language people are interested in are we're pursuing at varying stages as you know it's a lot of work you know so people oh I'd like to it's not like translating a novel you know you've got you first got to be able to translate all of the behavioral principles and concepts and that's hard then you throw in verbal behavior concepts and it, it's it's not so easy that might have been a, a little bit of a turning point in the interest on your work not only the behavioral community but the 
educational community, special services. Yeah, we begin we begin to get a lot of support. I mean, right now our our number one customers are school districts, and and they're you know mainly all over the United States, uh, uh, various school districts, and many of them are 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 not necessarily behavior analysts, but yet uh, part of my design of that tool would be that that you could run it. I tried to make it so that it was at least to some degree parent friendly with some support that that uh, the items are are pretty straightforward and and uh, besides the operant terminology, uh, you can run the assessment uh, as a speech pathologist and not really have any formal training and and so my, I, I, I learned mainly through Barb early on was that I had to win over the speech pathologist. I had to say, this is something that will help you. Uh, and, and ultimately kind of one by one in the, in the local area, but then around the country and then more and more speech pathologists begin to come to ABBA and, and uh, come to man sessions and interverbal sessions. You know, and they found it, this is, it's just common sense. It's practical that, you, you know, if you, if your language is solely under the control of objects and you can't talk about things when they're absent, if, you, if the repertoire is not there, you're going to have deficiencies. Now, a typical kid will transfer very quickly without much instruction. All of a sudden, they've got mans and interverbals and uh, you've hardly done anything at all. But for a child with autism or other developmental disabilities, uh, it was a lot of work. But you had to directly develop those, those other repertoires, and sure enough, you could if you focused on them. So uh, I, I think the VB map helped kind of launch us another level up in terms of exposure of verbal behavior content. It began to drive a lot of research questions and, and does so today. I mean, I look at some of the single items like um, one of the issues that we had in there was uh, to be able to respond to tasks that involve both verbal and nonverbal stimuli. That is, uh, if, if I said something like, um, you know, what do you do with this? And so what do you do with this? If I'm holding up an object, say, you know, uh, you have to listen to my question and look at what I'm talking about. If I said, where would you buy this? Well, if I said buy, then talk on it is no longer a correct response. Uh, if I said, what's this made out of? What's inside here? So you can take any nonverbal stimulus, give a, a verbal question. Kids with, with autism had a terrible time responding to that type of multiple control because basically it's a conditional discrimination where a verbal stimulus alters the evocative effect of the nonverbal stimulus. What I say about this object is dependent on your question. Uh, and now there's, and that was just one item on the VB map. And now that's become a whole line of research that there are two or three presentations here. There's probably 20, 25 studies in the literature now on, on that one single complex relation that, that uh, typically developing kids don't get till about two and a half before you can uh, 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 kind of fluently talk about things in your physical environment on demand. And so it's a fun piece. Uh, you mentioned that particular item and complexity more generally. I mean, do you, how do you see the the future of the VB map as you know, be, there will be behavior research? Involved? Yes. Well, we're we're starting now uh, to create uh, a generative learning assessment tool. So we've got the the VB map generative learning assessment is uh, in process. I've been working on that for a while. Actually, I did a lot of work before COVID, and my intent was. Uh, to publish a, a, a higher level VB map for uh, uh, kids that you know, had, had kind of maxed out on the VB map or that were getting to the top of it. But the focus of it was the, the repertoires that kids with autism often don't achieve are those things that are going to be uh, uh, automatic trainers of more language, generative in the sense that, as an example, once you learn to read, you can acquire all kinds of new verbal behavior if you have the, the, the repertoire of being able to, to read. Well, there's a lot of those repertoires, uh, you know, generalized imitation, generalized echoic skills, but when, when those cusps come together, some important things happen. Uh, for example, bidirectional naming uh, requires both listener and speaker repertoires. And when you combine listener and speaker repertoires, when you combine the tact and the listener, 
repertoire and a task. Uh, other things begin to happen. Uh, Sidman found that by, by simply combining matching to sample and listener repertoires uh, in the equivalence paradigm that you got an emerging tact or that you got an emerging textual relation without any formal training. But so when cusps come together, they create what we're calling generative cusps where uh, joint control is another example. If you've got a good echoic repertoire and you're, you've got a good tact repertoire, when those two, when two different antecedents control the same response form, uh, that's identified as joint control. That is when you're, you're you know, looking for a phone number or looking for some information and you're repeating it, like one of the studies this morning that was shown, um, they're teaching kids to uh, look at items and say, go get the spoon, the cup, the dog, and the cat. And they're having the kid emit the echoic response, spoon, cup, dog, cat, spoon, cup, dog, cat, and then go in the other room and if the child learns to do the self echoic spoon, cup, dog, cat, they go into the other room and they're able to discriminate and pick up spoon, cup, dog, cat. If they don't emit the echoic response, they don't do it. Uh, so joint control gives them some extra, extra kind of power. So um, uh, I've identified 32 of those separate repertoires that uh, we're calling cusps or generative cusps that uh, as I, I, and where a lot of this came from was I run VB maps on kids, look at their VB map profile, and then I begin to identify on the VB map uh, what are the generative cusps, what are the generative repertoires that are in there. So all across the top of level two, every one of those are generative, are, are, are what we would call cusps, generalized imitation, generalized echoic, a generalized manned repertoire. Um, a tact and listener repertoire that are 200 items, so the tact is there, the listener's there. Um, and and, and uh, again, trying to say, um, these are special. If, if you can get a kid to these, these different levels, well then you look at a child's VB map and they've got it mostly filled out, but then you look and what's missing are all these cusps. And uh, you know, they're not getting the generalized imitator. They can imitate 50 things, but it's not a generalized imitative repertoire, it hadn't reached cusp uh, status. Uh, so seeing a lot of that with kids kind of said, well, let's, let's separate all of these. And, and uh, so I did the, the generative learning grid and I would superimpose that on an existing VB map and go, uh, wow, they've got 100 points on the VB map, but they only have two on the generative learning. You know, that, that they're, they're scoring, but they're not, their language isn't developing the same way a typical child's language is, is developed. Uh, and an, an another personal development that's had a huge impact is uh, um, our oldest son, uh, he and his wife had a daughter, uh, a child who's now two and a half years old. Her name is Quinn. And uh, my wife and I babysit a lot for Quinn. They're close by. Both parents are working and we're super happy. We've been retired, you know, so uh, we're very happy to to babysit and care for her. And man, she taught me a lot about generative learning. I mean, I've, I've watched stuff happen with her and it just, it blows me away. You know, it's like, I've spent 50 years working with nonverbal kids and of course our kids, you know, I, I went through it all with them, but you know, we're in our 30s and you're working full time and you're trying to do this and okay, I gotta go to work, right? <laughs> but when you're retired, you know, you can just hang out and, and uh, I look at the, the generative repertoires and, and um, uh, she's got this, she's got this, she's got this. And I, and I was able to see it develop with her and to, to see things that I never saw with typical kids. So just, you know, one subject, one participant. And I, you know, I never, you know, like took data. I said, I'm not going to do research on her. I'm just going to, you know. So this, this the generative CASPs uh, BB map would replace or? or, or? Be a second, like a yeah, supplement. Good question. Uh, the VB map measures a set of skills, like some of the basic skills, like to get to generative learning, you've got to have a, a, a solid elementary operant repertoire, and, and the VB map stands in terms of, of those. Uh, the generative learning, most generative learning is not starting in typical kids till about two, the, the powerful stuff doesn't start till about two, two and a half, a little beyond that, and even up to now three and four and five. Uh, kind of skills. And so uh, I'm going to put this out as a, a completely separate uh, book. It'll be a separate assessment tool um, that, 
you wouldn't run on a child that's in level one of the VB map. Uh, I mean, you could, but you'd get all zeros. Uh, it's not designed until a child has an existing verbal repertoire. Uh, and then it's kind of a supplemental assessment. And I put it also in kind of a, a developmental framework so you can begin to look at where, where do you start? What are the, some of the early things? And there actually are some level one issues in the, in the level one uh, generative learning cusps are uh, the first, very first cup is, cusp is automatic reinforcement. And, and that's one where uh, an adult speech has to function as conditioned reinforcement. And if we look at how babbling occurs and, and a typical child acquires their language skills, it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, adult speech or, or peer speech is paired with, with lots of reinforcers all day long, pairing, pairing, pairing. So, uh, uh, and this is Skinner's analysis, if, if neutral stimuli get paired with reinforcers, the neutral stimuli become conditioned reinforcers. Uh, so babbling maintains itself because the sounds that the child produce sound like the mom or the dad or have some automatic reinforcement capability. A lot of kids with autism aren't affected by that, you know, or that they're not experiencing that. For whatever reason, there's no babbling, that, that you know, adults are aversive, they, they shut their eyes when somebody talks, that verbal stimuli are not conditioned reinforcers. A high probability of linguistic problems if, if that operation isn't working, if that type of reinforcement isn't available, because it turns out, and this is a, another thing of, of interacting with Quinn, automatic reinforcement is, is way, probably way more frequent than direct and contrived reinforcement for a typically developing kid. I mean, I watch her doing stuff over and over and over and over and over and over again, you know, and, and the product of the behavior is a form of conditioned reinforcement. So there's just one cusp that you can early identify that if that's not working, it, it's, it's going to cause problems because automatic reinforcement is also a a major variable in the acquisition of syntax and grammar. Word order and sounding like others. Dave Palmer talks about parody, where we learn to talk about things in ways that other people do and, 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 and such. Well, if way back at, at, at you know, six months old or three with a child with autism, if that's not in place, you're gonna have trouble with much more complex language. I mean, finding the answer to a math problem maybe more about, I got it, about the automatic reinforcements of being success, sex, successful and, and being correct, as opposed to an edible reinforcer or conditioned reinforcer. So uh, those two types of reinforcement have got to be operating early on uh, for a child. And, and so this tool is designed to kind of red flag it uh, for a child, but, but there's nothing, there's, there is no assessment like that uh, in the existing VB map, I do have in the vocal development uh, the different levels of babbling and sounds per minute, and that kind of reflects uh, the automatic reinforcement concept. Uh, part of what got me back, so I had mentioned that I had, I had done a lot of this pre-COVID and uh, was doing presentations at ABBA, and I laid out my, my grid of the 32 and, and lots of PowerPoints and all, all of that. Then COVID hit. And I was immediately thrown into retirement in the sense that all the schools as were, everything's closed, no kids anymore to work with. I was giving workshops maybe every other week around the country and internationally, all of them canceled. And uh, so it's like, I came to a complete halt and I had been considering and working toward retirement. I mean, we had been talking about it and I began to start phasing things back and cut down from 20 talks a year to 15 to 14 and basically starting to say no, no. And now it was none. And wow, retirement was really fun. I mean, it was like, I went, whoa, no more mans. <laughs> you know? Look at that. I was like, and uh, so I've been retired for four years. And uh, you know, I've, I've enjoyed uh, uh, babysitting Quinn, and, and we've been doing a variety of other things, and uh, still involved in various little things, but but no longer the uh, the big things. Coming out of retirement, uh, basically, was a function of arm twisting from colleagues. So uh, uh, about two months ago, I, I got an email from uh, Andressa D'Souza and Kyle Miguel. 
And uh, they both said, hey, you need to get back on that generative learning thing or we're going to do it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so we began talking and, and uh, uh, I agreed to come out of retirement and start working on that again. And uh, uh, we actually just, we met last night as a group for the, the first time, not on Zoom or not over the internet and, and just moved this whole project forward. We, we now have six of us that are working on it. Uh, and you asked about the research. And so um, uh, there's gonna be three people that are gonna work on the book, at the intervention book, and that's Danielle LaFrance and um, uh, Alice Schillingsberg and Sarah Frampton. So all of those are very, very active researchers on a lot of these different cusps. They're already doing it. So they, that's where they came to me and said, you got to do it. You know, and I'm going, you know, you guys are the ones that have the repertoires uh, that, that I need to, to help me get this thing finished because I no longer have regular contact with kids. And part of this is field testing. Well, uh, Alice Schillingsberg's uh, director of the whole clinical system at the Monroe Meyer Institute. And she's saying, well, I've got hundreds of kids that we can field test all of this on, and I'd love to do this. I want to get involved. So the six of us met last night and uh, kind of begin to lay out our, our tasks and timelines and what we're going to do. So basically three of us will work on the assessment tool and three We'll work on the intervention tool. And I'm figuring a year to two, something like that, to, to get it all, all done. And then, uh, you know, again, part of it is the field testing activity uh, in the sense that, just like I did with the VB map and the ABLES and earlier, you know, before that, is sequencing things for the assessment and is this important, is it not? I mean, the whole man training procedure, by the time we, we published it in the teaching language book, we had been messing with it for 20 years uh, since since Western Michigan work. And so it constantly evolves, and, and um, uh, uh, that's where um, having electronic versions, I've been considering, and I have to see, a, of, of just doing this as an electronic version, in part, as you know, a hard copy version is, is hard to manage. you got to ship them and pack them up and you gotta have a, a printer and it's cumbersome in in so many ways and and uh um you we can make changes quicker uh within the the uh, electronic system but um i'm fortunate again to have been surrounded by people that are currently doing research in generative learning i mean kyle miguel has just transformed so many aspects of behavior analysis by his work in bidirectional naming and you know looking at relational frame theory from a verbal behavior standpoint and being able to say well you know a frame of coordination or a frame of hierarchy from a verbal behavior standpoint is this this and this and look at here's these studies we produced to frame a hierarchy without uh, uh, the methodology that relational frame theory is is uh, 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 suggesting or, or or built on, or the conceptual break away from Skinner's verbal behavior, and and that's something that, you know, <laughs> Jack was so <laughs> say unnerved by the relational frame theory uh, people, and uh, what they wanted to do to verbal behavior and what they didn't understand about verbal behavior, and so Kyle uh, and his students uh, have have just been amazing in terms of of the research they've published in JAB and JABA and the analysis of verbal behavior on these complex aspects of language without ever leaving verbal behavior. You know, we don't need a new theory of language to be able to analyze complex behavior. Uh, and and, and I mean, it's a major issue as we see in behavior analysis, that rift in the field. Um, some of us say, well, we've, we've, there's no riff here. We've been doing the same thing for 50 years. Uh, other people think that it's not working, but uh, I, I think it very much is working and it has the conceptual capability to take us to that higher level. It's just nobody's done it. Um, I mean, I, I look at our early days and we were so focused on just getting people to do man training, you know, let alone, you know, bi-directional naming or, or 
didactic frames or whatever you know the, the, the complex concepts are, so many of the kids with autism were at the very basic level and, and uh, uh, our focus was on developing that probably for the first 20 years, plus none of that was really available. I mean, we had Sidman in the 70s, but I, Jack, we, we always conceptualized uh, the Sidman equivalence paradigm in, in the elementary operant, speaker-listener interactions. The very first thing Jack had us do with Sidman's triangle was put tact, listener, textual, and you know, here's how it all happens. And, and uh, uh, Horn and Lowe's explanation of how uh, bi-directional naming works is, is very solidly behavioral in the role that echoic behavior plays. And so you look at how those repertoires come together to get bi-directional naming, you need to have an echoic repertoire, a speaker repertoire, a listener repertoire. When you have all of those, you can learn just a tact and get the listener with no trials. You can learn a listener repertoire and get the tact with no trials. But it doesn't mean there's no events that are occurring that causes that. There needs to be an echoic repertoire on the part of the, the kid. If they, if, if in a listener, if I say touch camera and, and they do that, now if they make an echoic response camera, they've, they've got a little tact trial in there as well. Uh, um, and so putting it back into the verbal operants allows, allows us to look at those same complexities without leaving the tools we've already established. Without We know how to do a coic behavior. We know how to do multiple control procedures where we bring multiple antecedents together and convergent variables. And um, Kyle's been able to give us a, an empirical foundation of that. Uh, so. Again, he's one of the guys that kicked me in the butt. He's also one of Jack Michael's students. And uh, we went out to dinner last night, and he's showing me pictures of 22 years ago. And I had dark hair, and he looked like a 15-year-old. <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, uh, the potential for verbal behavior to become a fractious topic within the field. I mean, you have people that are more attached to a more, let's say, the traditional or Skinnerian analysis of verbal behavior, all the people that are, uh, you know, RFP oriented researchers, mm -hmm. the Kavas people that are doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you see how this whole end? It's time we start collaborating that, uh, you know, we've been kind of arguing for several decades now. Let's, let's collaborate. Uh, and Doug has been supportive of that, and and Kyle has also to some degree, but but his motivation is more showing how relational frame theory can be explained in verbal behavior terms. But he's he's been super successful in in being able to interact with the RFT folks in a way that I just couldn't do. Cabus is a little bit different. Um, it's a it's a verbal behavior based program. And uh, Doug has his own versions of some things and uh, is, is clearly behavioral and Skinnerian, but his view of verbal behavior is, is a little different in, in various ways. So, and and uh, Kyle's been working with him as well and they've, they've interacted on a lot of um, uh, issues and so on. Uh, so trying to bring all the camps together is, is a little gradual. Um, you get, I think, you get stuck in your own methodology and, and you know, we're, we're very much stuck in the verbal behavior camp. Um, I've, I've changed in the sense that uh, in 2018, I was asked to give an address at FABA on relational frame theory versus verbal behavior. And, uh, while I had certainly thought about the topic a lot and, and such, I had never given a formal presentation. And so uh, that was pretty nerve-wracking, and it, it basically forced me to read the Purple Book, to go back and read the Hayes and Dermot Barnes' uh, uh, book and uh, the RFT literature and to figure out what it was that, that they're doing. I went through all uh, Mark Dixon's peak material to see what what are they assessing here and how's this all fit and what's going on um, and the conceptual papers and, and primarily for my own understanding um, and, and 
also because here I was, I was going to be talking in front of 2,000 people as a keynote address at FABA, and there was a heavy RFT audience <laughs> there. Um, I, I needed to learn what they were, they were doing and, and, and to translate it myself into verbal behavior terms and be sure. I mean, there were times when I was going through a lot of that content and I'd go, oh my God, they're right. They're right. We didn't do that. <laughs> and then I'd go, well, wait a minute, maybe, okay. And, and, uh, but uh, until I fully understand, I'd, I'd say I, I still don't fully understand, but I certainly have a working knowledge of it. Uh, that I didn't have before that contingency of, of having to talk publicly. And since then, I, I, uh, until COVID, then I probably gave that talk another 10 or 15 times and refined it each time and got better and better about talking about the interfacing of verbal behavior. Um, I'm not sure I made a lot of friends in the RFT camp. Um, uh, that was not necessarily my intent. My, in, my intent was to clarify for VB people how to get to the concepts that they were talking about because those concepts were very critical and you need to be able to do those, but you don't need to abandon verbal behavior or behavior analysis as we know. Specifically, you don't need to abandon a molecular analysis and go to a molar analysis, which is basically a relational frame theory is very close to Kanner's uh, uh, um, inner behaviorism as a philosophical foundation and um, uh, I, it's not the direction I want to go. Linda Hayes and I were graduate students together uh, at Western Michigan University. Uh, uh, she was Linda Parrott at the time. And, and uh, Jack Michael used to have uh, we, Sunday morning meetings. So it was Sunday, Sunday, uh, Sunday morning with Father Michael uh, for several years. And he invited, you know, there's maybe eight to 10 graduate students, pretty much the same group over, over the years. And Linda was part of that group, although Linda, Jack was on her committee, but Linda was, uh, her chair was Paul Mountjoy. And Paul was on my committee as well. And Paul was a Cantorian. And uh, uh, inner behaviorism was his, his whole thing. So, and that was Linda's interest back in graduate school was a Cantorian view. And I think she brought that with Steve Hayes's uh, orientation and kind of much of RFT has that molar uh, Cantorian feel, and that's that's due to due to Linda. But uh, uh, I mean, we all learned a lot together, and it was great having Linda in the in the Sunday morning meetings, along with Marge Vaughn and uh, a variety of, of of Jack's other students, and and uh, so we talked through a lot of those concepts. But we weren't where we are now. RFT didn't exist, and we're all young and kind of formulating things as, as, as things would occur. Um, but so when it, it came back time for me to talk about RFT versus verbal behavior, I, I did put it in the context of a molecular and molar treatment of language and suggesting that our needs with children with autism, we got to get down to the nuts and bolts. I mean, we can't, you know, you, you can't even do relational framing until after two years of age that you've got the foundational skills. Well, what do you do before that. And uh, Mark Dixon's first manual uh, was what you do before that, but that was all our verbal behavior content. It was not relational framing. It was teaching man's tax into verbals, echoics, uh, the basic elementary operant, speaker, listener skill, you need all of that. And then at a certain point, they all come together. Uh, and equivalence being the, the, the probably the most well-known example of, of those effects, but they don't occur until about two years of age. Um, and what I begin to say is that, well, so what's the practitioner supposed to do? Change their, their whole theoretical orientation at two, you know, that, that verbal behavior only works up to this age with these skills, and then you need a whole new theory of language. And that to me seemed crazy. I mean, it's hard enough to get to people to learn a, a verbal behavior analysis. And I'm thinking of classroom teachers and speech pathologists and parents that now have to learn relational framing if they want their child to be able to do a verbal classification or frames of hierarchy. And, and we were doing verbal classification fine. We, we were able to do it without relational framing by just manipulation of molecular variables. And, um, and we didn't need 800 trials to establish a, a component. RFT doesn't have a solid foundation in early intervention for kids with autism. I mean, that is, an analysis of language should cover all of it. 
I mean, you should, you only need one analysis from babbling to dementia, you know, or all the, all the way through. Uh, an analysis of language should be consistent regardless of the complexity of what's being analyzed. And to me, again, I think that, that there's a lot of power in verbal behavior that's not been unleashed. Um, uh, I think people are now getting to uh, the concepts in the second half of the book. Autoclitic relations, went to an autoclitic talk this morning. I mean, this, I look at what's going on here at, at the conference now. We got joint control talks, bi-directional naming, autoclitics, man's for information. I mean, all the complex stuff, whereas 40 years ago it was first man training, you know, and first tact training. But I think the field has matured to where We've got the tools to start taking on more complex behavior. And, you know, as we talked about last night, this is going to evolve. I mean, we're just, we're all going to get something out there, start field testing, because we all know each one of these individual components of, of the tool are all important aspects. And again, a lot of them are, uh, have their own lines of research on developing them. And our job is to get them to the practitioner, get them out of the lab and get them into the classroom, get them into the home with, user-friendly procedures and, and uh, uh, concepts that um, uh, match typical development as much as possible, that they, they match uh, what, as a speech pathologist, you would, you would see needs to happen. You need to get the child to where they're not dependent on contrived reinforcers, that, that they're not dependent on discrete trial, one-on-one, -on -one, in-your-face kind of, of, of learning that you've got to learn on your own. And, and so how's that happen? And that's kind of what we're after beginning to figure out. Um, hopefully, I, I look at this and go, let's get this all set up because this whole new group of young researchers, we're going to lay out a research agenda for them. Because uh, each of these, the, the five that I'm working with, they all are working in universities and they all have master's and doctoral students. Uh, and actually, last night, Kyle said, well, I, I'm going to uh, apply for a grant and get a sabbatical and work uh, uh, on this for my sabbatical, if I can pull that off. And, and that's how motivated he is uh, to be able to pull together. Because again, what we want to do is, we got a lot of individuals doing a lot of stuff, both in verbal behavior and CABIS and RFT and so on. But there really is, there's no assessment tool or intervention tool um, that brings everything together. And I think that that's kind of what we're doing. And that's why I included in this, I do have the, the relational framing in there. Uh, and, and of course, the bidirectional naming and equivalence, and, and uh, you know, as a, as a kind of standalone concept, are you demonstrating stimulus equivalence and class merging and, and uh, those other issues? When we did this stuff in the '70s, we were all super excited about it. I mean, it was like we we knew we had something, and nobody knew anything about it for the most part. But we saw it work every day, and we had Jack who was telling us you know, what to do next, in what direction, and, and uh, uh, a lot of confidence there. And then we had uh, a, a, a massive number of masters and PhD students ultimately that became very interested in the topic. So we developed our own verbal community, we saw things work, and we were all really excited about it. Um, this new tool, uh, my goal, I want to get you guys, my five co-authors, you know, who are all like 40, you know, <laughs> get you guys excited about this stuff because this is the first thing that I've come across really in 40 or 50, 40 years maybe, that's been as exciting as what we did in the 70s. And that's what I said, what I, what I did for most of my career was to try and get out to the community what we did in the 70s was to develop the assessment and intervention. Now we got to put it in the hands of people, continue to refine it and make it valuable. Now this is a whole different game, uh, which is very exciting, um, uh, enough that it brought me out of retirement, uh, but I, I don't plan to be out of retirement too long now, <laughs> but long enough to get, get this done, but, but hopefully the result will be that uh, a new generation of, of behavior analysts uh, become more interested and excited about verbal behavior and verbal behavior applications. Uh, and teachers, parents, speech pathologists, other professionals who are involved in helping a kid learn to talk. Mm -hmm.